Oh, good morning. Good morning. Glad to be here. I'm Greg Rathley. Um, many of you I know, I'm, I'm a wheelchair since 1976, we decided this morning. And um, <clears throat> for many years, I, I practiced law. Um, and the last 26 years of my practice, I was, uh, <clears throat> I was the last guy to get out safely in, in Ottawa County. I was, the, I was the corporation counsel for Ottawa County. I retired in, in 2017, and um, I'm very happy to be here alive. <laughs> um, anyway, um, Jared was singing a song, and I heard the first words of that song. I'm not sure I quite have them, the first song that he sang. I'm not sure that I have them right, but basically what I heard was, um, what are you going to do after you die? Uh, something like that. And I thought to myself, Listen, well, maybe when I'm finished, they'll all come back and haunt their relatives. <laughs> um, give it some thought. Give it some thought. Um, anyway, what I'm going to be speaking about is uh, speaking with the dead. Um, and I know that sounds sort of uh, mystical or um, uh, sort of like uh, looking at, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not a theosophist, I don't go to seances, I don't, uh, none of that stuff. And I have no overwhelming belief as to what it means that I hear voices. It, as far as I'm concerned, I could be making them up, and I probably am. Or I was dropped on my head at the wrong time when I was a baby, which is, is, is quite possible. But I'm going to read a, uh, some poems that sort of raise those issues and tell you a little bit about my work. What I, what I'm working on now, which I've just finished, is uh, this book called Barley Child. And um, it's about my Irish past. I'm, I'm Irish on both sides, although my name, Rapley, is actually Dutch, but they, they, uh, they, uh, uh, the, the Dutch men found some attractive Irish women, and, and so we've been bred through four or five generations of Irish women, so, so I consider myself Irish on that side as well. My parents, or my mother's side is the Gannon uh, side of the family, and, and they're, they have, they have, both sides of my family have lots of problems, but they have some problems. This is the story of me being born. Let's start at the beginning. This is the story of me being born. Um, I'm at a, um, or my mother is at a uh, showing of the film The Informer, which is a 1935 film uh, directed by John Ford, starring Victor McLaughlin. The uh, film was based on the novel The Informer by Liam O'Flaherty, and what it's about is a, a guy, Victor McLaughlin, who is a drunk, and he in, is a member of the IRA, and he informs on an, an another member of the IRA, and the British uh, come and shoot that other member, and then um, the IRA is chasing Victor McLaughlin around, the, um, around Ireland um, because he has informed. And so I thought about this poem, and I thought, well, maybe I am the informer in, in, this, in this book. Uh, that's a risk I have to run. Uh, I'm, I, my mother is uh, pregnant. She's not quite due. She's not married. I am the child. She's drinking. <laughs> because I wish to avoid extravagant claims, and because God is patient with the unborn. Among the nascent embryos, I was a poet of brass-cut oaks, oats of dingle cheese, of grilled hake and muck-tilled potatoes, of soda bread with salty butter. Then she moaned, and I was alive, oh, alive, in the cheap seats of a midnight matinee, halfway through a pint of Old Crow and a rough cut of John Ford's The Informer. Our story. America staggers through the long count at Busan. There are Nixon and Roy Cohn, Sid Charisse and others to come, and after these, a new frontier of moonshots and whirly satellites. But oh, I am coming too, your tiny blue babai, loot strangling, wheezy, cursed, cutting loose of ma'am's pretty pink womb and a wee bit drunk, baked for the requisite season. Call an usher, summon the charnel cart, a red pole torches a heavenly pine, and God sighs and says, on with it then. 
So I fold these scraps in oilcloth, say a knob's prayer for safe passage, and slide, so shatty Irish, to a wild indigo sea. That inauspicious beginning is how I got here. Uh, anyway, um, I decided to write about my family. I know absolutely nothing about my family before I started this book, and now all I know is all lies, uh, but uh, not entirely. Uh, but, but I found out some things about my family and decided to write, and one of the things I found was I was hearing voices. People from the past were talking to me, my impression, okay? And again, I'm not a theosophist, I'm not claiming this is real. It's probably due to a head injury, which I, which I had several in my, my youth. Um, anyway, as many of you probably know, you Latin Catholics that helped the Protestants out. <laughs> Lourdes is a small town in the Pyrenees Mountains of southwest France. In 1858, Lourdes was said to be the site of as many as 18 visitations by the Blessed Virgin Mary, as witnessed by a young girl, Bernadette Subris. Uh, she was later canonized as St. Bernadette of Lourdes. The town became a shrine to Mary, and the faithful often go there in search of miracles, including medical cures. Jonas Edward Salk, 1914-1995, uh, was a virologist and medical researcher. In 1955, it was announced at the University of Michigan that Salk had created a clinically effective vaccine for the prevention of infantile paralysis with polio. That's a little background. I'm never told of family funerals. Not since the wake when I was nine, when I stole a cushion from Benny's couch and propped Aunt Rose high in her casket, sliding a Pall Mall between her fingers and a bourbon tight in her grasp, all nestled among the amber decades of a cut glass rosary that they looped through her veiny hands, a relic she'd carried home from Lourdes the summer after the sock vaccine, when the greater ants said, surely now, the Blessed Virgin would cure Aunt Rose of polio. No matter. In the afterlife, I knew Aunt Rose would toss away her brace, her crutches, and two-step among the American beauties, that not even Jesus would begrudge her a party smoke and splash of whiskey once he had seen her dance. When it came from the Rollick kitchen to her casket in the parlor, Uncle Jim laughed, as the greater ants shuddered and crossed themselves. <laughs> Father Mahoney yanked me by my ear to the front porch and tumbled me to the rain to contemplate sin and my vast effrontery to God. I hid in the back of the cavernous old Nash and smoked the last cigarette I'd caged from Uncle Jim's coat pocket, coughing and drooling, praying hard to the Virgin offering myself up that I might somehow be saved. And from that day, the oddest of my dead have fluttered through my dreams. Sweet nut hatches, nodding, wheat weeding, so eager to explain. Uh, <laughs> well, after four books, I sat down to write this one. Both my parents are dead, so I thought I could tell the truth about about them at, at maybe at last. Uh, and so I made this book up. <laughs> uh, they've never read any of my books. I, I mean, I, they were alive through four of them, and I did, did talk about them, not really complimentary terms, but they were always proud that I wrote a book, but they never read any of them, which was good. Uh, anyway, this was the first voice I heard, and I heard this voice really clearly. Annie Kelly is a real person who died, she heard her, her um, Grave is in Biddeford, Maine, where my mother's family comes from, in the Catholic cemetery there, and it's right with the Gannons, which is my, my mother's name, a Gannon. And uh, Annie's sister was married to my grandfather uh, with, uh, years uh, ago. Anyway, so grandma, grandmother died, and Annie continued to live with uh, uh, Jim because she didn't have anywhere else to go, and Jim married, remarried, and she, he remarried a, a French woman. A French Canadian, because a lot of the French Canadians were there working at the guilds along with the Irish and, uh, and everybody else. Uh, the Central Maine Sanitarium at Atwood, Maine, near Fairfield, Maine, was founded in 1910 and under state control from 1915 
until its closure in 1970. It's a uh, uh, sanitarium for tuberculosis. Um, they took uh, tuberculosis patients with advanced cases of the disease in the sanitariums at that time, an effort was made to serve attractive and nourishing meals on good china and with quality glassware and silverware. It was hoped that good food and table service would encourage the appetites of the tuberculosis patients, which were often suppressed by the disease. And there actually are a group of people who collect the china and, and serving dishes from uh, these tuberculosis sanitariums. It's, it's, it's a hobby, a, an adjunct to uh, collecting old china because it's, it's really elegant, it's really nice. They spent money on this to make an attractive dinner so that people would eat because otherwise they would be wasting away. Annie Kelly, 25, the Central Maine Sanitarium, Atwood Mountain, Maine, June 17, 1922. She died several days later. After Maggie died and he remarried, I stayed on at Jim Gannon's. I had nowhere else and each of them so needful of what I made from the mill. It was all right for a while until McPhee from the weave room caught me hacking up a wad of Livy snot and saw, saw the wicked cloud of blood smeared across my cuff. He called the mill doctor who pressed a stethoscope to my back. You've got TB, Annie. You're out of work for good. Jim's Canuck bride cursed me in French and I smiled behind my breath mask the day the health nurse took my elbow and helped me board the train. As tiny spike, I wore Maggie's straw boater, trimmed with a sprig of snowberries pinned against the black band. To bid us eat, eat Annie, eat. The china plates are lovely, a creamy white with crimson stripes milling the edge, a top mark with recumbent moose and pine, framed at right by a sailor, left by a reaper, leaning to his side. All of this topped by the North Star, underlain with the word Dirigo, our state motto, meaning I lead in the language of the church. I stare at the plates, but feign no interest in dumplings and stewed lamb. Mrs. Cleary, who sleeps beside me on the porch, cackles and says, made your bed, girly, best lie in it. Though coffee, bloody sputum, to a tin bowl, untangling my sheets each morning I am able, I cannot believe so little is true. I am beyond desire, save to go down from this sleeping porch some fevered night when the lantern bugs are lit, to strip away my sweat-stained gown and holding my arms across my untouchable breasts to fall on to God down the side of this hill. I have misled no one, anytime, anywhere. No one will follow. That was the first poem that I thought, that's not me speaking, that's somebody else. Where that voice comes from, I think it comes from her, but I don't know how it got here, I don't know. I, I guess I, if we have to come up with reasons, I mean, let's, let's think about um, uh, maybe Joseph Campbell, or um, uh, you know some of the, some of those people that, that that talked about mythologies and things. I mean, maybe that's the source of this kind of thing. But I was I wrote that like I said very quickly, wrote it down. I revised it a bit. I've changed the line breaks, but I really haven't done much with it other than that. And that felt like that was a woman's real voice talking about her impending death. Um, is it true? I, is it is it really the voice? I don't know. Is it true? Well, I think it's true. True in the sense that it might not have really happened, but there's a truth in there that, that speaks to me. One of the people I can't speak with, I hear, but I can't really engage with him, uh, and, and probably that's because I'm still afraid of him, is my father. Um, because I was born early, my, my um, well, so I was born at all, uh, my father felt he had, he's been an Irish boy, felt he had to marry his good Irish, or his Irish girlfriend who was pregnant. And so they eventually ended up pregnant, or pregnant. <laughs> they eventually, ended, they, had, they had more kids too, but they eventually ended up uh, married. Um, and uh, this was a source of continual disappointment to my father. He, he just, he was an alcoholic like my mother and he hated the fact that he had to marry her, I believe, I believe. 
And of course, he had to marry her because of me, and so I was the target of most of his feelings. So I dream about it. And in this dream, my father decides that we're going to go ice fishing. My father owned a root beer stand up north in the Indian River, and uh, which is on Burt Lake. And uh, great place to ice fish in the winter. I mean, they had sturgeon in there even that you could, you could catch you know, if, you caught, if you had a permit. In a dream, my father decides to go ice fishing. Da calls collect from hell, says spud a hole through the candy ass ice. Hammer our sign, blood red, above the shanty door. He's not here for rock bass. Not come for bluegills, big as your useless hands. He's trolled this trench on squalid summer nights. Has milted the eggs and sunk a battered dash to build a reef. Has nursed these schools from glow rooms glow worm sprats and is going deep again after bull huss and viper fish, after alligator gar, after eel pouts and snake heads, all gilling across the silt of our secret spot, their needle teeth, banjaxed eyes and grisly heads, their hellish miltonic fins, Whatever we hook, we'll toss, gasping onto lake ice, scattered out between the shanty and the sled. So cold they'll be, frozen before they recall open water as we smoke and shudder and drink. And which one of us, my prodigal, will walk out under the wolf moon and blistering stars, tally the hoard and have a final sip as the other drifts away. Who will rise before dawn, stack the sled with carcasses, and leave the last to dream alone, leaving the last to dream alone, drag our dead back to the morning shore. I try and stay away from him. He pops up once in a while, but <laughs> get a little lazy. I, and, and I, I'd like to explore that in the future in another book. This book is primarily about my mother's side of the family. Dad pops up, uh, but um, I'd like to look at my father's side of the family as well at some point. They, they basically disowned my father because he had to get married to marry me, so I, I know very little about that side of the family as well. Uh, I mean, I met my grandmother a couple times, but that's about it. Um, okay. Um, this is my grandfather on my mother's side, and um, this is, he's, 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 this is a photograph of him, um, and the, the title of the poem tells you what you're going to get from the poem. Jim Gannon with Dog and Model A, January 12, 1928. He stands in the Biddeford cold, enough snow to say, yes, this is winter. And because we have a name and date penciled faintly on the back, we can be sure the glowering little man is my grandfather and is here almost 60 years old. He looks older than this, of course, looks tired, nerve shot, angry with whomever is taking this photograph along the lap board rise of a shabby mill-owned tenement. Could the photo have been snapped by Armand Cote, Jim's Quebec in-law, who had a Kodak brownie, sported a mothy beret, and worked as lead man over at Diamond Match? Perhaps, though it's hard to know, the photographer is nowhere named, and there is not a shadow of a body washing forward, leaning to a lens, to a focal point, shadow gray across the snowy drive. Jim stands in a wrinkled shirt, a dark tie, half Windsored under an ill-fitting vest, his dress pants ballooning, a paper boy's cap that hides, no doubt, a bald spot, Sunday shoes, uh, no jacket and no gloves. We also see two skinny rear tires in the dark down curve rumble seat lid and convertible top of a Model A Ford Roadster with a 1928 main plate, 02254. This car cannot be Jim Gannon's. Too broken now to hustle the big looms, he's only a ride-along teamster 
an overage delivery boy for the mill and could not afford a junky old car, let alone a new Ford Roadster. Nor would he be able to buy kibble for a dog, not one as hapless as this, a mix of ruddy Boston Terrier and Shad House Mutt. It's a mystery why Jim holds the dog's leash so oddly. Loop handle in his left hand and the leash stringing across his vest to his right where the cord is held with only the index finger and thumb of his right hand. And then down to the sorry little dog. An affectation almost twee as a desert saint might be de depicted in some Italian painting from the early Renaissance, holding a sprig of, sprig of thyme or a tiny bird's egg for all to see, by which the viewer is to understand faith or the depth of God's love for a lonely saint, surviving upon the merest trickle of a nearby spring, upon bread crust dropped miraculously by wheeling desert birds. But here, we learn only that the churlish man does not like this dog, that the dog tugging against her leash, pulling sideways to the scraggly winter hedge, will yap and yap, will distend her tongue up and down against the choke of collar and lead, and is unwilling to pose, to still herself within the viewfinder, because she does not much like the man who is holding her back, either. A man so eager to be in his stuffless chair, out of the cold, away from the yappy dog he hates and the car he can never afford, that he will not smile and welcome us into the frame. No, he says, hurry up and save the pity. Get an eyeful, you bastards, and turn the page. <laughs> uh, in... Uh, uh, 1915, the um, cotton house at Pepper Mill. Pepper Mill is a gigantic place. You've been to bid for it. I mean, it's huge. It's still there. They made, made it into condos or something. And anyway, they, have, they had a huge building where they put the cotton that they brought in by ship from down south. And uh, in 19, October 29th, 1915, the cotton house caught on fire and it was destroyed. Um, in uh, dollars at that time, it was about $500,000 loss in 1915 dollars, in $2,022, that'd be $14.7 million. So this is a big, big loss. And when that cotton house burned down, there was no cotton to, to make a cloth with, so it was a, quite a horrible thing. Uh, they never found out how the fire was ignited, so no one knows. I mean, cotton is very flammable. Um, the poem suggests a possible way in which someone who's very much like my grandfather, although I do not name him, may have been involved in the fire. Keep in mind, this is just a couple of years after the um, uh, Bread and Roses strike at Lowell in, in the mills there, uh, which were, uh, you know, the, the Wobblies were very involved and the anarchists were very involved in that and it became violent, uh, not due to the, either the Wobblies or the anarchists, but due to the owners of the mill, it became violent. Um, but it was very much on the mind of, of mill owners to, to uh, investigate things like this. Cotton House Fire. It has a, a, a epigraph uh, from Plato in the allegory of the cave. True, how could they see anything but the shadows if they were never allowed to move their heads? October 29, 30, 1915. I did not torch the cotton house at Pepperell Mill, and you cannot prove I was there after 9 p.m. drinking whiskey from a flask atop the Pascagoula bales we carted from the dock last week. Let's say someone did have an oil lamp and was rolling a smoke with scraps from a tobacco pouch and the French papers Eddie brought back last Saturday from Portland. Anyone could have bought, bought those. I say this in speculation and wonder, as I know not a bona fide fact, have heard but few nasty rumors, and anyway did not drop a lit cigarette nor splatter lamp oil down among the bales. There's not a proof I was sparking the magic flashers Eddie may have also brought back, so cheap, at, from Cult's Magic City, snapping the papers, flitting them to air, to illumine, to light up the cotton house, all sorcerer-like, casting black shadows, phantasms, great dark shapes, vastly horrific, 
against the rafters and brick walls like a magic lantern show exactly, like something from Plato's allegory, a book I did not read. It cannot be proven <laughs> I can read. The nitrocellulose crackling, exploding, incandescent, burning with a brilliant flash, leaving no ash, no crispy paper residue, tricks I meant solely for the amazement of tenement kids, for a few rowdy neighbors on Halloween. When I left the cotton house, there were no flames at all, no smoke but what curled from a puffed out match from my last roll up, which I surely recall grinding to the pine floor, towing the butt flat, and no, not dropping it, ash orange down through the cracks between and among the oily bales, the interior of the cotton house otherwise dark as Pashkagula at midnight, the bolt of the great door sliding back, latching with a raspy thunk, no reason for any reasonable man to think, to hope that a fire had been set, that it would come to flame, that the cotton, that bricks and timbers would burn all night and collapse in smoking heaps of brick and ash and glass, of workers' dreams and scorched, soggy bales. <laughs> I, don't, I, I, I don't know if they accept this confession. I, I guess I would. I would as a former prosecutor, I would have signed the warrant right there. Uh, uh, the 20th Century Limited train, everybody remember the 20th Century Limited? Uh, it ran from New York to Chicago and then from Chicago back to New York. It was a, the first really deluxe train. The New York Central ran it. It was, it was really deluxe. Um, it ran from 1902 to 1967. And the phrase red carpet treatment is said to be derived from the passenger's use of a specially designed red carpet to walk on the train when boarded. The train was the principal setting of the film 20th Century, 1934, directed by Howard Hawks and starring John Barrymore and Carol Lombard. The film is often described as a prototype for the Hollywood's screwball comedies. Um, Dowsie Gannon, that's my mother, age two in Cleveland. She's on her way from Cleveland to Jackson, Michigan, or from uh, Maine to Jackson, Michigan. Three times coming and going, coming again, they have sidetracked and stopped dead for passage of the 20th century in a rumble of coal and iron and smoke. Its singular call, not a whistle, but an echoing horn, a long brassy howl with red carpets rolled and loop tied, waiting at both ends of its speedy Chicago runs. The mom says in her best English, each time more sadly, there goes the 20th century. They have sold all but what folds in cardboard suitcases. Dowsy keeps a rag doll. And are chipping fares halfway across America to live out Da's goodbye days in Jackson, Michigan. This train was all aboard in a Buffalo rainstorm and stops at every junky town that dots the Erie coast dropping off milk cans and grimy chemical tanks, once even hooking up an old slumber coach for a short tug to Ashtabula. These stops, the sidetracks, lull the child to sleep. Then cranky, she startles awake when the throaty Mohawk engine bump couples or cuts loose another stack of cars. It's 4 a.m., the brake lines hiss away steam. They are entering Cleveland, Ohio, sidetracking to a station, pulling ever more slowly past Mr. Rockefeller's refinery, past the fiery Bessemer rolling mills and the Irish flats, past the Haymarket and the jolly all-night Leon of Sing Long Lo Chop Suey. An hour before the train pulls away, Di eases back on a station bench and drinks deeply of laudanum, prescribed by Doc McCain for Da's dusty millstock cough, as Maman carries Dowsy deep into the big hall where Dowsy stares at the sunflower ceiling, a painted sky aglow, arcing blue behind the flowers, the wide black-eyed flowers, like so many bumblebees, like so many befuzzled eyes, watching her, divining a word she does not know. Do the schizophrenic voices, her Gaelic pukas, already mother? Dowsy whimpers, she slides to the marble floor and howls, kicks with her sturdy legs and diaperless, wets the floor and her cotton smock, 
drawing looks from the passerbys, a red cap, a wimple nun, two sailors on leave from Chicago. Petite mère, Mama cries in her native Quebecois, loud enough for the nun to cross herself and blush. She recalls her vows, her vows as bride of Christ as Mama struggles dowsy up from her puddle. She carries the howling child, its tiny hands rowing the circumference of teacups back to the nodding da, pulls the laudanum from his breast pocket and forces three good drops, maybe more of this tincture of opium and grain alcohol down Dowsey's throat. Who can safely say how much she gave her more than 90 years on? It is hot, Dowsey thinks, eyes wide and startled at the silence, then, a, then to a squall of baby coughs until she forgets to cough and whatever burns within her body, as with an iron shrug, the 20th century rumbles by again, its great brass horn howling through the pithy sumac that grows unchecked where the famous train makes such quick work now crossing the Cuyahoga River. Uh, I, I, I know nothing about my mother. And this is one, one little thing. I shouldn't say nothing because this is one that I know happened and is true, absolutely true, according to her. She's kind of a prevaricator, so who knows? <laughs> anyway, the Naval Air Station in Grosseal, some of you might be familiar with that, uh, in the Lower Detroit River was operational from 1927 to 1969. During World War II, over 5,000 American pilots received training at Grosseal. Um, mostly Navy cadets, along with over a thousand British RAF pilots. The list of airmen trained at, uh, at Gross Hill included George H.W. Bush, the first President Bush, and uh, the actor Paul Newman. My mother was visiting her sister, which my mother was in an institution then, uh, Mercywood, uh, which was an uh, insane asylum for, uh, that was an insane asylum in my <laughs> uh, And without on a weekend pass, visiting her sister, who uh, was uh, in uh, Wyandotte, and her husband were there. They both worked, it was the war, they were both working um, all day long at the uh, at the Willow Run, the, the, the big factory that was making bombers. Helldivers. This is about the Curtis SB2C Helldiver. It was a plane, and this is set in Downriver, Detroit, near uh, Wyandotte, along the river. July 1943. The girl who'll be my ma'am is alone, out of the asylum on a weekend pass, sprawled on the steps of Maggie's faded two-story, listing as the hell divers from Gross Eel strafed Plum Island, sortie after sortie, each scored by an ensign aboard a gray tug, anchored at mid-channel because practice makes perfect and our best will be needed at truck and Iwo Jima. Not supposed to drink, Amo Barbital, too young. She's on her fourth beer from Wadi's extra icebox and is eating blind robins on dark rye. Who had a blind robin? Horrible. Oversalted herring fillets, stinky, the worst snack ever. She knows that Paul Witkowski, who slumped in a wheelchair on the porch of a bungalow kitty corner across St. John Street, who lost both legs and much of his face to flaming bunker fuel aboard the Oklahoma, will persuade himself the hell divers are Japanese zeros and begin to scream, sure that he's back at Pearl. Four hours a day, seven days every week he wails, unless the hell divers thumping live ammo to the Plum Island mud before pulling up and circling back, their high course engines roaring all the way down Eureka Road don't score well enough and need more practice. Sometimes flying deep into the buzzy mosquito dusk, Paul Witkowski and Mam, echoing those perfect machines, wail for wail, scream for scream. Uh, what's the time? Two minute warning? Give me the two minute warning. Um, I, uh, I'm, my mother was in Mercywood, uh, according to the story. She was also there with uh, the uh, Michigan poet Theodore Rifke, 
Blue became one of the most famous poets in America. He went to the University of Michigan and he taught at what was then Michigan State uh, College. Uh, and then he had a, a he, he drank a lot and he had a mental uh, situation where they put him in Mercywood and my mother happened to be there at the same time. At Mercywood, Theodore Ruthke instructs my mother in the care and feeding of peonies. The, the Ruthke family were from, um, were from Saginaw and they were, they had, they grew flowers. They, they, they were big, uh, what do you call those things, the glass houses? Greenhouses, they had greenhouses and they grew, grew flowers and sold flowers. So Ruthke grew up in that business. So he could teach my mother to take care of peonies. Uh, St. Dimpda is an Irish saint in the 17th century. She's the patroness of those afflicted with mental and nervous disorders. In the asylum greenhouse, the moon all aflux, up through the crazed glass, with spades, with hose, and a red barrel, will scratch among the dormant ones and untangle their roots, cutting tendrils, sorting, culling spoiled eyes from good, and lay the sage in wire baskets, hiding them beneath the pine bench. We'll settle the roots in terracotta pots with loam and compost, wormy, fragrant, and well-drained, and tend to the easiest, quick to spread, needing only sunlight and garden lime. Peonies with lovely heads, shaggy and pink, white, lavender, and red, hardy against the bitter cold. Winter must pass before these will bloom. And you, child, prima donna of the day room, ought smile in the ice baths, the ivory tubs like lifeboats, their tall prows lifted, plowing on through gray-tiled seas. Near the iron gates should pause as the bells chime noon and mumble your beads. Ought weep for the hair raised, the electric, as they are rolled back to their rooms. Speak not of shotguns, of ice picks, of mahogany incubi who mutter beneath the mahogany stairs. Don't tell the nuns I've said as much. Worse that you believe a word the old grumble growler says, lest you never end your voluntary commit and stay on in this glass house, chartless and overpilled, Beloved of St. Dimphna alone, whom the stuttering priest, just back from a dipsomaniacal tour of the Bronx, dubs the madhouse mistress of us all. Yeah. One more? Okay, that's the cycle. One more. Um, uh, I just went, this is a fun one. Uh, on August 5th, recently, we had the 48th anniversary of, um, no, it was on the 30th of J July, the 35th anniversary, 48th anniversary of the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa, okay? The title of this poem is Jimmy Hoffa is Missing, <laughs> August 5, 1975. At this point, I was in law school, and I refused to work with my father anymore. We, we had had a huge blowout and, and I was down there so he, he and I could use some money you know I <laughs> didn't have any money you know the job I was in law school so uh, he calls up and says why don't you come on up here and do this Jimmy Hoffa is missing Jimmy Hoffa is missing vanished six days ago near Detroit where he was supposed to chat up some wise guys about the blue sky future in pension funds the smart money has him cooling under a freshly poured slab of concrete somewhere in the suburbs. I'm not that smart. Doc calls, hasn't spoken to me in a year, tells everyone I'm dead. I thought this was meant as metaphor, but Da doesn't do metaphors, doesn't care if they are the bearers of ravenous change into a petulant world. Today, it seems, I'm Lazarus. Da says, let bygones be bygones. Says he'll give me 500 bucks to hitchhike north, dig a rectangle, set forms, and pour a six inch slab of concrete behind his hot dog stand. Needs it for storage. <laughs> hey, I'll take
take a stupid money. Doc says, you can work at night after we're closed. It's cooler. I begin that night, and by 6 a.m., have the rectangle dug, am ready to tamp it down to set corners and forms. By midnight following, it's ready to pour. Now, Da says, dig a trench in the middle of the forms. Sissy has, quote, some useless shite to bury before the ready mix is poured, close quote. On the radio, I'm playing the Clear Channel Detroit station, and all night the talk is Jimmy Hoffa. Where is Jimmy Hoffa? They're taking listener calls. I'm two feet deep in the trench when I recall the quaint tale of my birth. Blue boy, wheezing for breath, born at night in an artsy third-run grindhouse to a drunken, unwed Irish girl. The film was about an IRA guy who's killed in revenge for leaking a name to the Brits. That was 22 years ago. I'm still no wise guy, but I wasn't born last night. So I'm running south under a waxing moon, the Celts call vengeance and death, through the cedars and jack pines along the Pigeon River, past a double decade of those goddamn bloody beer blinds. Wow. Thank you all. Thank you.